Welcome to this fifth AXA webinar in the Curriculum in a Crisis series. The AXA, the Australian Curriculum Studies Association, has put on these talks uh, with a number of guests kindly volunteering their time to address some of the issues that have come up through this pandemic and the changes to the nature of schooling and curriculum delivery that has been a result. I'm Phil Roberts. I'm a member of the executive of AXA and also a researcher at the University of Canberra. I'll introduce our panel this evening. We have on my left or right, depending on which perspective we're using, uh, Natalie Downs, who researches distance education, parents in distance education, rural schools, and access networks, which we will explain shortly. Welcome, Natalie. Thanks, Phil. We have um, from Queensland, Tammy Irons, who's the Queensland president of the Isolated Children's Parents Association. Welcome, Tammy. We have Michael Barber from the United States of America and California, where it is a brisk 2 a.m. or so. So welcome, Michael. Um, really appreciate you getting up at this hour to share your insights from your research with us. And we have Alana Moller, who's the federal president of the Isolated Children's and Parents Association uh, with us as well. What we wanna do here is outline a number of the issues and experiences from the panel and I'll uh, go around and ask them various questions they can address so they can both introduce themselves and the lessons that they have. And then we wanna raise some of the issues that the recent pandemic and the homeschooling phenomena has, has caused. To begin with, um, one of the things that struck us when we put this series together was a lot of what has been happening recently with the schooling at home for so many children and the reaction of this being so new or difficult or challenging is mildly ironic because all the work that people here on the panel do and their own schooling even is based around schooling at home online. So this is something that's been happening for a long time in Australia. So there's a lot of insight and wisdom out there. It hasn't really been tapped in as much as it could in this uh, recent pandemic. So I'm gonna start with the ICPA perspective and we have um, two perspectives here both as, as a teacher and someone who does the homeschooling uh, in, in Alana. So maybe Tammy, I'll start with you. Could you share us some of the experiences of rural students from your perspective? And then Tammy, I'll ask, uh, sorry, then Alana, I'll ask you to, to add to that in terms of the role of learning at home, what works and how do you go about your everyday practices? Tammy. Thanks, Phil. Um, I guess uh, from my perspective, um, growing up in a small rural community, I guess attending small rural schools throughout and then going on as a teacher as well. Um, I've experienced teaching as a home tutor when I was younger, uh, not my own children, unlike Alana, who's had that pleasure. Um, however, I, I guess um, I see a lot in my role with ICPA a lot of um, issues that, that go on for our parents that are doing DE. I know a lot of them, uh, most of them, I think, really enjoy the experience and the time they get to spend with their children, which is a fantastic opportunity. Um, however, it's also fraught with the, the issues that have gone on in the past few years, along with um, the online learning in terms of connectivity and continuity with, with teaching staff and also having their own classroom, I think, which Alana can talk about more and touch on. But um, these kids, I guess, that are at home and then having to come into their schools to meet um, only a few times a year. So I think an essential part of it is a teacher is really critical and those schools are critical to those kids and having to um, make sure these kids still feel like they're a part of a class, um, which can be quite difficult, I would imagine, um, in that respect. So we do, uh, as ICPA, we have a lot of dealings um, with a lot of our family members who are part of that. and. The ongoing um, concern for us at the moment is always that feeling of belonging uh, when you are a part of an individual um, learning classroom rather than that that, that is um, at an actual physical school. So we've, um, we've done a lot with that along the way and um, the whole online learning thing I guess is wasn't new to the majority of our families so when the pandemic has hit it certainly we were able to offer our members were able to offer a lot of tips around how parents could actually cope with and, and do the best that they could at the time um, with their students learning at home. Oh, it helps I take myself off mute, doesn't it? It's, <laughs> I see a number of the issues there around relationships coming through as being really important about building that sense of, of connection. 
Um, I know I'm sure that's something I think Michael will, will touch on when, uh, when I, I ask him shortly. Um, Alana, from the point of view of working at home with the kids in the room, and I see you're, you're in your home classroom there. Yes, correct. That's right. This is our schoolroom slash office this year. So what, what are some of the experiences so in how you go about your work in that context, in, in that room even, that uh, are lessons for others who have been thrust into this space of late? Um, to follow on from what Tammy said, certainly, and, and what you're mentioning too, the relationships, it's definitely something that I think um, we have to really always constantly be remembering and constantly keeping in mind for not only our students, but also for home tutors and for, for the whole family to make sure you've still got a connection. And I mean, an internet connection, I like a connection with, with other people in your community, and other people who are, who are in, experiencing the same thing as you, because we are um, so far apart from each other but we're the only ones who each understand what's happening for us. And, and certainly in, in um, other discussions I've had and, and throughout COVID, it, it's been something that I've tried to put forward as well. We've tried to put forward as us to ensure that you continue that um, connection with each other because you need each other, even though you're in a different situation. Um, and, and certainly for my children, um, that's something that they, particularly as they get older, really struggle with is, is not... They feel like they're the only person who has to sit at home with their mum doing school, you know, and, and um, because they can't see anybody else, can't uh, interact with anybody else um, in a physical sense to understand the only ones in the situation. And and perhaps this time around, so I had two of my girls had to come back home or been away at boarding school, um, and did they enjoy it very much? They certainly prefer to be with all their friends and in a, in a situation, but because it was so much more widespread, I think that probably made it a little little bit um, uh, challenging for them because there were more people doing it. Whereas in a regular situation, there's not that many people who, who are doing distance ed or they're schooling. I think um, we're having a little bit of patchiness in, in the connection there too. Um, just so you're... Yeah, my uh, apologies. I, I noticed that, yeah. I think it, um, it, it interestingly highlights yeah, the, uh, the challenges the number of our rural people have, perhaps. I think we'll, we'll get to those in our discussion. I think we'll get to those in our discussion. Um, Michael, again, I'm hearing a lot of talk about relationships here. And I think from some discussions and work of yours that I've seen, relationships are a really important part. But what could you tell us about internationally some of the the, uh, the work going on that informs us. And I know schools are going back at the moment, but I think this, this whole lesson highlights issues around schooling that we can all use moving ahead. Well, definitely. And it's, it's, it's interesting. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys because uh, I think that we are likely going to learn a, a lot from your experience only because of the nature of your school year, because for most of our systems, they're actually basically the school year would have ended somewhere between two weeks ago to four weeks from now. So um, our school year usually runs August, September until May, June. So many of ours aren't worried about what it looks like coming back until um, September, August type time frame. Um, but yes, um, when you look at the the research that we've got out there, there's um, uh, a great deal that speaks to the the nature of relationships. Um, uh, particularly, I, I, I'd highlight some of the work that a, a colleague of mine, Jared Borup, has been doing. Um, over the last number of years, he's been putting together, um, I'm trying to remember the latest name of it because he just rebranded it in March, but it used to be called the Adolescent Communities of Engagement Framework, or the ACE Framework. And it's still called ACE, but he's got a new, uh, the the A and the C, if I remember correctly, have changed, um, and I'll find the link in a second. Toss it up in the the, the chat there. Um, but it looks at this idea of essentially how the uh, types of support and the specific actors that are available in the distance environment from those at the the school level, those in the the home environment, and those in the community can 
um, help to, to build the, the types of relationships and supports that students need in order to have success in the, the distance environment. And it's a really, I think, a, a useful way of thinking about um, how we can serve the individual needs of particular students. Thanks, Michael. Um, and I just wanted to also mention that in, it, when, in the work that um, I've done with Natalie next to me here, Michael's work has really come up uh, constantly as someone leading in this space, which is why we're so thrilled that you could join us at uh, this, this uh, unspeakable hour. Michael, just to follow on from there, so I don't want to go just push down only the relationships aspect. There's various other bits of research out there around this mode of learning. Um, one that came up, I, I saw that you, you mentioned was around um, the preparedness to learn online. And that seems to have been something that's caught a lot of people out in our context, not being prepared to learn online. Yeah, that's a, a big one. And even for those that are in planned distance education programs. So if you sort of, you know, forget the whole emergency remote learning aspect where everyone was thrown into it, um, it's unfortunately still quite a common thing that, you know, students that would engage in, in many of our DE schools um, and as I've sort of looked at things, I think it's as true in your country as it is over here in North America. When we look at the, the Canadian and the, the, the U.S. context, I know it's true of the, my colleagues in New Zealand that I work with over there. Um, one of the things that we do a pretty good job at is when students first enroll in these DE programs, there's usually some sort of orientation that provides them a sense as to how to use the system. But very rarely, or in only a very cursory way, do we have any sort of preparation for how to learn in a distance context, um, regardless if that's, you know, in a more supplemental environment where they're in a school, but just taking one or two classes online, or if they're doing it completely online, you know. Um, most of the kids that we work with, you know, they've had eight, 10, 12 years of experience of how to succeed in the classroom. They've had no direct experience often when they come to us about how to succeed in a, a distance or remote environment. And um, we don't really provide them with a lot of good strategies and, and, and set up to help them succeed. So um, it, it's one of the reasons why when we look at the the, the data we often, particularly in the first time that students take an online course, we often see a dip in their uh, performance anywhere from 10 to 20 percent in most instances of what they would normally be getting in most of their classroom based courses. It's certainly an interesting um, gap. I guess, uh, um, Tammy and Alana, I'd like to come back to you before I go to Nat on the broader Australian experiences. Um, what about the preparedness to learn? in that mode that your your children have been engaged in is there much learning how to learn online that you've experienced maybe we'll go to alana first this time yeah sorry Phil. um if you can i'm hoping you can hear me okay uh so not really um so uh, the children tend to start um, so now they can start e kindy. Um, so my third daughter had a full e kindy year before starting uh, with prep in Queensland. And so uh, basically, in a lot of ways, it was up to me to, to learn as well. With the eldest daughter, um, with our eldest child, I, it was up to me to work out how everything was going to work for me. The school certainly supports you and, and gives you ideas and, and gives you, um, you know, the information of what you need to do, but ultimately when you're in your own schoolroom and your, your own house, you have to um, figure that out for yourself. And it's, um, in terms of um, preparedness, it's not only, I guess, preparedness in terms of to learn, it's, it's making sure you have the resources available that the children need, making, whether that's internet resources, whether it's computing, computers, technology, MAB blocks, if they're doing maths, there's just such a wide range of things that you need to have available. And, and most of well, particularly in the younger years, but across all distance education, is having somebody to supervise them and someone to help them and support 
distance education experience because they, they can't do it on their own. Um, and so the preparedness sort of comes not only for the child, but also for, for the um, adults or, or the parents or the, the family that's involved in it as well. Um, Tammy, anything to add to, to that? Because I think it's certainly, it's one of the fundamental issues, I think. And uh, I think Natalie will mention it in terms of the, the kids who do school in the access mode and other areas. So. Yeah, Phil, I think um, too, it comes down to the preparedness even of the teaching. If I can touch on the other side of what, what mm -hmm. Alana was saying is, is um, the actual teachers being prepared. And personally in Queensland, there is no actual like a university course that these teachers can, these pre-service teachers can actually take part in in order for them to be prepared in how to teach online. And it is such a different, as many of us teachers ourselves have just found out during the pandemic, it's not as easy as just stepping out of a classroom and in, into an online environment to teach these children. So there's lots of um, techniques you need to be um, getting used to and not just the technological part of it, but um, also the part where behaviour management comes into it and those techniques that you can use to keep attention spans, especially with younger children. So there's actually a lot that goes on behind the scenes for teachers as well. And I, um, I think there's probably more scope for us to play in general um, for preparing teachers in teaching in distance education as well and those online platforms as we go forward. Um, Natalie, I think it's a great point to bring you in, both about the experiences in Australia, the access networks, but I think you probably want to start with that uh, the issue that Tammy was just mentioning, because I know there's something you, you have to add to that. Uh, yes, so Tammy, you mentioned there's no preparation for teachers in Queensland, that's actually Australia-wide. Um, so looking at all university courses, there is nothing that specifically prepares teachers to work online in a distance learning setting. So they might be prepared to incorporate technology in their teaching, but not teach online over technology to an audience. And in New South Wales, for example, it's quite common that we've got distance education schools and what we call access networks. And that's where the um, 11 and 12 school students um, share teachers amongst different schools so that they can access specialist subjects. And these teachers um, might just be straight out of uni and first day they have to teach online to students across various locations. Um, so that's an interesting issue that hopefully COVID has highlighted. So I think, just can you just explain what the access networks are? Because it's a slightly oh, yeah. different model yeah. to what we've talked about here. Yep. Yeah. So access networks is where the um, students are based at their local high school, um, but they may be taught online by another teacher at another school in a similar area, but at a different school. So some of their learning is online via a learning system like Moodle, um, but otherwise it's also online via video conference lessons. Yeah. And that's part of this, the standard delivery. So the kids go to school to learn online. <laughs> it's, uh, they don't have a teacher in, in the school. So there's so much wealth of experience there from the range from that model to the model that Alana's working with, with, with her kids. The next question I think I want to put to everyone uh, is if you had five tips for, for parents about how to support learning in this environment, what would those five tips be? Um, maybe I'll go with you, Nat, because you're, you're next to me and then we'll go back in the sort of reverse order. <laughs> Awesome, thanks Phil. Um, my first one would be to uh, reimagine how you think schooling should occur. Um, so most of us imagine it to be nine to three in a classroom with a whole bunch of children. Obviously in distance ed, that's not the case. And if we start to rethink it and not think of it as having to occur that way, then distance ed has a, an awful lot of advantages. So um, students on isolated properties, for example, have access to a wealth of learning opportunities if we just start to look at those rather than thinking about a science experiment in the classroom. These children have access to that in their backyards. Um, and same with schooling occurring nine to three. Well, it doesn't actually have to occur that way. Um, most distance ed parents would probably tell you that it rarely happens between nine and three, um, or nine and five even. <laughs> um, and it's, it's seamlessly integrated within your day-to-day -day life. Opportunities arise, you just teach the concept as it arises, and um, so then don't necessarily worry about teaching it online or in the classroom as was planned because you can say yep my, ch my child knows that already we just did that last weekend um, so in, building on that context matters so think about everything you have available to you and not necessarily what you would find in a school book thanks Nat. 
Um, I think that's really important when we've seen the, uh, the discussions happening around what schooling looks like and so many parents worrying about getting their kids up to be there in the morning and in this present environment. It's like, well, it's okay. School doesn't have to happen in those hours. Um, Michael, from an international research perspective, if you could try to distill down five key, key strategies or, or things, what, what might they be? Well, it's an interesting question because uh, back in actually starting around the middle of March when this first started happening over here in North America, uh, one of the things that I undertook as a project on my blog was to um, interview a bunch of my colleagues, both practitioners and uh, researchers, as to um, actually, well, two suggestions two th questions I asked them was what suggestions would they have to teachers that are being thrown into this environment and then what advice would they have for parents whose role in the educational contract has changed quite significantly and um, I'll post the link to those in the um, in the chat in a second so that folks can get them but we went through and actually interviewed about 27 folks so um, you can get suggestions from each of them on those they're short little um, but most of them are six to 10 minute videos. Uh, some of the things that I heard again and again as I was you know, looking uh, through that series, um, a lot of just practical things. Um, you know, one of the things, and many of us who are remote working for the first time are, are learning this, um, that distinction of when you're at work and when you're at home sort of fades away unless you've got some sort of environment for work. And the same is true of school. You know, the, there's something about actually, you know, traveling to a physical building that prepares kids for school. So if you're able to set up a space in the home where, you know, that's a space that's used specifically for the student to do their schoolwork as opposed, and not just sort of, you know, sitting on the bed type thing. Not saying that they have to do all of their work in that space, but it, it creates that sort of mindset that you, you can create. Um, one of the other things about going to school is in many cases, you know, it burns off a, a, a bit of energy. You know, there's a, a reason why we, you know, make kids do uh, certain things. You know, we've got recess in and, you know, we se sequence out the day with specific breaks to allow kids to, to burn off some of that energy. And it's important to do that in the home as well. Not that you want to go and sort of wear them out, but you know, you, you, you want to get them in the position and the mindset and both the, the physical aspect where they're willing to sit down and actually, you know, do some of the, the work that needs to be done. Um, and, and then, you know, as uh, Natalie mentioned, you know, taking advantage of the surroundings that you've got, uh, not just the, the physical surroundings, but the, the, the human surroundings as well. Um, you know, during this time, while we haven't been able to sort of visit a lot, we've, we've engaged a lot in, in communications like these. Um, I know I've probably spoken to my niece and nephew up in Newfoundland, Canada, more in the, the past two months than I have in the, the previous three and a half years that I've lived in California, um, just because, you know, that um, partly because they've needed help with these kinds of things, uh, you know, with their own schooling. So those are just some of the ideas that come to mind, and there were literally dozens of things that were, were mentioned in that particular series that I'd, I'd recommend. That'd be great if you share that link, Michael. That'd be fantastic. Um, we need to share the one we did for a blog as well. Um, Alana, I don't imagine uh, tiring the kids out is something you have to worry too much about in, uh, in your school. Um, getting them into the schoolroom sometimes is quite a challenge, I can tell you that much. <laughs> um, particularly in the morning, first thing in the morning. Uh, if, if I can follow on uh, with regards to the space um, that Michael has mentioned, and yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that, that they need somewhere to be to be able to, to do their work. And it's something when um, some of my older daughters came back to do school online um, with COVID, um, at, I had, was in my first year after after 10 years of, of having um, at least two and sometimes three in the schoolroom, I was down to one left until then. And so we had to change things around and rejig things, but that then in turn meant when they came back, that meant we had to rejig things again um, to be able to fit them in for them to be able to um, do their school effectively because absolutely you need to have a space for them to do it. Um, so that, that's certainly, and, and not only the space, once again, like I mentioned earlier, 
resources and, and those things that they need to use, whether it's for a small child, Play-Doh, blocks, bo uh, boxes, all those sorts of things. And then for older children, it may be something different. So that's certainly something that, that really jumps out to me. Um, and, and then with that, that leads into reading. And all kids, whether they're little kids or whether they're big kids, like to be extrinsically motivated. They like to have a reason for doing something. And, and there are times, and, and you know, I appreciate the, the, you know, if it's not working, you don't do it or you, you go outside or you whatever. But sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you just have to keep plugging on because something's due today or you've got a task the teacher needs to see. You have to keep plugging on. So something as simple as having a, a lolly box in the schoolroom to be able to extrinsically motivate the children to keep them going. And even big kids like those types of things. So simple. And I know regular, in a regular classroom, that type of kids get stickers and, and lollies and, and I use that within my schoolroom as well because it works. It absolutely works. Um, I, I, I can't say enough how much the connections and supporting each other help um, and talking to other people who are in the same situation and making sure your kids have connections with their teachers and their, other, and their peers as best you possibly can. But in saying that, so that's, that's a tip, but in saying that, you've also got to do what works for you. So it doesn't matter if someone says, oh, look, you know, this was amazing when I started this, and you try it and it absolutely falls to pieces and it does not work. That, that's not what works in your school room or what works for your family. Um, and so it's important to remember that. Even though you need to go to other people for support and for connections, you do also under, need to understand that your situation is individual, your family is individual. Um, and then that leads on to my fifth tip, I think I went through five, um, that I, I don't believe distance education within your own home can work unless you, the whole family's involved in it and uh, supports it. So, you know, my husband will come in and he'll do the do hand painting with, with when the kids were smaller, with, he might do hand painting with a little kid while I do reading with an older child. Or um, wait, I might get the older child to do reading with the younger child while I've got to do with our business because, you know, I work, work at home, we run a business, my husband, we know we run a cattle station, so I, I do the book work and all those things. So um, just bring the whole family because not work if someone's not helping in some way, I don't think. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. And I want to I, I, I want to come back a little bit later to that issue around um, getting them to the, to the school room in the morning. Um, I think there's these issues around what we think school to be uh, in this institutional sense and what schooling is in many people's experiences like yours and your, and your children's. Um, uh, Tammy, I think you, you've got a, uh, a bit of a experience on both sides of the fence on this one. Yeah, um, I guess, uh, yeah, I, I could never teach my own children. <laughs> I know even doing homework was difficult. There always seems to be one that you just can't get along with. Um, but I think uh, to sort of, I guess, um, as an umbrella across all of those, I was a girl guide and be prepared is always uh, a big motto of mine with any sort of teaching and learning. And I think that sort of probably encompasses a lot of those tips is um, if you're prepared as a parent or as a teacher to actually um, be providing the, the resources and so on, staying calm, don't sweat the small stuff, as we've said, um, maintaining flexibility wherever possible. Um, as Alana said, sometimes that's not possible, but um, if you can, as if something's not working, try something new. And also, as Michael mentioned, using all of those um, resources that you have on hand. And it's not just, as he said, the physical ones. For me, it's also the human ones. Um, during this pandemic, I've seen some really fantastic um, ways that parents have done that. They've used grandparents to do their lessons via Zoom, by getting the young, like so I teach prep, so getting those younger kids to read to them or doing reading with them or even just going through an activity with them um, that allowed the parents at home to do some work while they were sort of being supervised by their grandparents. So I think um, remembering that we've got all of those human resources on hand as well to help you out when you are working from home is, um, sorry, teaching from home is also really important. So, yep, that's me. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Tammy. I think one thing that's popped up constantly is, um, I don't know, the, 
the fetish of technology that we can do these things with technology you know and now we have zoom that we're all we're all on now um but it also depends on other bits of technology so you know uh, with alana being out where you are when the access to the technology and the, and the broadband and so forth um you know, even where i am in a smaller country town we still have patchy connect connectivity sometimes what are some of the technology tools that you've seen engaged with in this space and which ones have been really really helpful and which ones haven't quite lived up to their to their promise because we see a lot of um advocates for for new technology including zoom etc but often they just become a fetish in themselves for want of a better word um maybe natalie should i start with you on that one since uh since you're there uh sure <laughs> I, I shouldn't I was, because you're there but you know, <laughs> I was actually thinking of the raising the issue that um, tech, the idea of technology can become part of the problem um, in that everybody is viewing it as the solution. So, okay, we now have this Zoom product. You guys are connected to a teacher. It's no worries at all. But do you actually really have your child on Zoom from nine to three with their teacher anyway? So the online component we need to remember is only a small part of the distance learning. Um, and that's probably my key reiteration from focusing on techn technology. And there are distance ed students who don't actually have the online technology set up. So some people still do phone lessons and instead of the video calls, and the teachers just find ways to work around it as do the parents. Um, so it's just learning to substitute, I guess, and remember that technology is not the one and only solution to everything. Before I come to you, Michael, on, on this question, um, I was talk talking to a colleague of mine out in Western New South Wales who, most of their kids don't have access to technology at home and to be able to do lessons online. And that's why they come to school to do lessons online at school, because that's where they can get access to the technology, which is not more of a case of uh, the, the social context in which we're talking about rather than necessarily always physical infrastructure, though that is, a, is an issue. Um, that's one thing. But the other part being the video lessons. So it's all great to deliver um, lessons some some of those over video conferencing technologies but then it's the learning management systems aside beside that that become a whole another thing to manage on top of it and just become a form of content transmission rather than forms of engagement so it's been one of the challenges that i've sort of seen in those in those contexts um, even with my own kids in this period some of the work's just sort of been more work transmission rather than uh, learning scaffolding which is something that a lot of our 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 panel, but teachers in these contexts are very familiar with. Michael, you've um, got a good international scan on, on all of this stuff. Well, if I, I remember the question, it had both the positives and the negatives. And so I'll, I'll start off with, I think, one of the, the shortcomings or one of the, the tools that I've seen that has been a little bit problematic. And that's actually the, the tool that we're in now, Zoom. Um, both Zoom in particular, but also the synchronous classrooms in general, because, you know, as I think you've sort of set me up for, um, these synchronous tools were one of the easiest for classroom-based teachers to adopt when they moved to a remote environment, because it gave them the sense that they could do what they had traditionally done in the classroom because you know now i can see the students and i can they can see me and i can do what you know the, the song and dance that i'd normally do in many cases and so we saw a, a real um quick adoption of without much thought to the pedagogy that was involved in there and particularly with a, with a lot of thought to the the equity issues that you raised you know the just because someone, even if they're not in a rural area, you know, if, if you've got, you know, two or three kids at home and mom and dad are also uh, working remotely, uh, that's a lot of, you know, hits on the, you know, the bandwidth that, that you're trying to deal with to be able to, you know, run some of these synchronous tools, you know, forgetting about all of the security issues that Zoom had, um, you know, when they first uh, started, and even still to this, you know, still to this day, there, there are still some issues with it. And then there's also the ones that we're seeing, uh, I'm not sure if it's come up as much in, in, in Australia uh, as I've seen it, it hasn't been as big an issue in the US as it has been in Canada, 
Um, but this idea of, you know, whether or not um, it's appropriate to have students on Zoom where you can see them because, you know, as everyone can see here, you can see everything behind all of us here. And, you know, there are some, you know, both real privacy issues that are, are uh, of concern there when not only do you have a teacher, but, you know, 20 or 30 other kids that can see, you know, things that are going on inside of a student's home. But, you know, there's also issues around, um, you know, students don't necessarily want everyone to be able to see what their home life is like you know for many kids you know being able to go to school and just be one of the other boys or one of the other girls is actually an escape for some of them um, not just you know on the, the 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 low end of the spectrum but you know uh, for folks on the other end of the spectrum as well um, you know so there are a lot of you know privacy issues that that we haven't really thought through as well when we first started to uh, adopt these to the point that many of the teachers unions in in Canada now have actually started coming out and have been recommending that teachers come the fall when schools open up again uh, reconsider their use of Zoom and how they're using it and what they're requiring students to do in it. So, uh, I know we had a, uh, a well-known comedian over this way who um, was jumping into people's uh, Zoom meetings and, and uh, posting clips, which was uh, rather amusing. Um, I think uh, one, the other one I've sort of seen on later social media is a, is a site or a, a feed around bookcase credibility, looking at everyone's bookcases in the background. Um, so, um, so good to see that we, we haven't um, set ourselves up to be on that site anytime at the moment. So, so. Um, Alana, you've had a lot of experience with the various bits of technology. Which, which ones have you found really uh, worked and maybe haven't delivered to their potential? Um, yeah, so um, I've, uh, so I'm in my 11th year of uh, distance ed in that, in that 11 years there's been some incredible changes with technology um, from when my eldest child started in the school room and all she had was the telephone and, uh, you know, she did a half an hour lesson a day with her teacher and all the rest was done with me. She had a half an hour contact with her teacher for the day. There were five other students or four other students on lessons with her and that's all the, that's all the contact she had with her uh, peers other than when we did go to enriches and outreaches and things. So um, it's sort of come right now to where my where you know my, everything's on online for them in terms of um, their teaching with their teachers. The our school uh, still does use any video. Um, I'm a, actually a little bit pleased about that because of, as Michael said, um, I don't necessarily want them to always see what's happening in our school room, um, especially when you have little children who do all sorts of things with their clothes and such. So you don't always. But our school has chosen not to do that mostly because. They don't know what internet level everybody's got. Um, now, at, at the moment, the in improvements in our internet connect connectivity has been astounding um, over the last couple of years, and COVID has even increased that, to made that an even even better connection. Uh, so possibly it would work, but for, for tonight, for example, if I turn my video off, my connection uh, and audio would be so much better um, on our satellite selection, just because there are sometimes those latency issues that we have to deal with. So the school consciously doesn't use video for those reasons. So in as much as the online lessons are great, um, and it's so good that the teachers can see what the kids are doing online, um, that that's, is a limitation that they've, that we found of it. Um, the other issue, and it's, there's some really great resources we're given and all our um, curriculums online and those sorts of things, which is until the day that it's not working or the minute it's not working or the half hour it's not working. So, you know, if the power goes off in the middle of a lesson and the, te and the kid, you can't do the work, but lessons online and those sorts of things. But there are other technologies available. So we still, we still at our school get printed materials. Some schools don't get printed materials anymore. Um, that's ten, it, Different in different states, different jurisdictions, different schools even have different situations like that. But um, all the online resources until when they don't work or when you can't access them. Um, 
One thing that has been amazing for my kids, um, I've got a couple of really, really good readers who love reading and um, up until a couple of years ago, um, they couldn't get new books. They just had to have a book here because we couldn't get to town to go to the library to borrow books. Um, being able to have books online is just sensational. Would be the one of the most amazing things for my children personally of anything that's developed out of technology that's over, over the last 10 years. Does that help? <laughs> I know that certainly that certainly helps. Um, I think uh, the whole connectivity issue, I think, is a, a, a huge one, and really interesting the way that suddenly we could have more connectivity overnight because of COVID, which says, well, it was there beforehand then. But even I know um, that leaves with me because the, the small coastal town down the road where where she would normally be at this time, um, we can't rely on her the connection. So it's uh, yeah. Um, tell me. Last but by no means least on these technology uh, tools. And we'll, we'll come to broader equity issues um, as well after this. I think you're on mute. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, as, as issues with technology. Um, as Natalie was saying, technology is certainly not the be all and end all of, of the learning at home. Um, however, I've definitely personally seen some really fantastic um, platforms that we've been exposed to throughout this time. Um, I've personally gotten to use as a teacher and, and obviously from the family side of things, the families have loved it, um, a platform called Seesaw. Um, which for the younger kids has proven really, really popular. And so now we'll continue to use that within our classroom and for homework purposes as well. So, um, but I've, other teachers have been using things like Weebly and so not just relying on Zoom, um, Sway newsletters, et cetera. So there's lots and lots of things, but it's also highlighted the limitations around those. You know, um, I think Bandicam and Loom, we were trying to do recordings and they all have these time limitations. So you're in the middle of reading a story and it cuts off and you're, then you have to re-record like 10 times to get it right. So look, it's, you know, there's so many, you see all those funny bloopers at the moment of all the teachers trying and how many times they're having to actually re-record stuff. And by the end of it, we got to the point where it's like, oh, well, families, you know, yep, I made a mistake. I wouldn't be able to fix myself if I was in the classroom in front of your child. So I'm not going to fix myself now. So I think um, while the technology has definitely allowed us um, to be able to do these things at this time, and I think that that's probably one of the highlights that we're going to see come out of it is, is the uh, possibility of being able to revert to these sort of platforms when we're in times of crisis like drought and flood within our country. And hopefully we can see that if we've been able to do this during this time when kids, more as a short term solution, um, obviously, but these are, are things that we can see now developing where we might be able to see some uh, use of in the future, not just for these purposes, but for other purposes as well. So I think that's been a fantastic thing to come out of it. And um, I like Michael talking about the having, you know, the privacy issues, but I feel as a teacher, and I don't know how, like as a parent you feel, but it's um, been really lovely to see the kids um, in their own habitat <laughs> and make them sound like animals. But it's, um, it's been really lovely. I feel like I've actually gotten to know these kids that I, in ways that I wouldn't have been able to before. And it's, I've been able to hear their little notes as they're reading and what they're saying to themselves and those sorts of things. And it's actually allowed an even greater connection and an even greater relationship than I think I would have had if I was just in a class face to face. So I, I'm going to miss that part of it. And I think that that's maybe a highlight of distance education, that there is that opportunity to get to know them in a different way to face to face learning. So back to the relationships being being central for, uh, for all schooling, but particularly in this sense when our, our kids aren't, aren't co-located. So two last issues to to um to come with and i'll start the first one i'll start um i'll come back to you tammy the first one being about equity so we've seen over the last 30 years going back even further but particularly last 30 years of the internet our our kids have been told right you've got online learning now and this is providing you access in a way that um you didn't have so that's a really awesome equity um, advance but then we're seeing in this last three months everyone else in the community who's suddenly been thrust to this what was an equity approach 
going, we can't learn this way. So yeah. here's a, here's an, here's, we've got an opportunity then through this contradiction to uh, highlight some of the issues for the people for whom we advocate and, and work with. What would be some of the, the, the key um, lessons there in those those contradictions that you would really like to sort of see highlighted for the future agenda? Yeah, I think communication is a key one. Alana can probably touch on that because it's more of a federal issue. But in Queensland, we definitely have, um, have seen that for many years coming to our conferences from members um, with communication issues. And as Alana mentioned, the advances in that, in that have been amazing. Um, which has been wonderful to see. We're seeing um, the, the NBN, Telstra, all of those coming out with um, amazing advances, which are definitely allowing an increase for connectivity for our um, rural and remote um, families, which is fantastic. But yeah, I, I agree. We've seen this um, inequity arise and we've had a lot of media around, um, I guess, that, that this is something that we deal with on an everyday basis as rural and remote families and has been something that we do have dealt with all along. And realistically, it's taken this pandemic to actually highlight these issues to those in metropolitan and regional areas. And it seems it seems um, inequitable because as soon as it's happening in the cities to a lot more people, it's suddenly a much larger problem and something that we can do more to fix um, a lot quicker. Uh, so that's kind of, um, I guess that's the silver lining of, of COVID for us is, is that it has actually highlighted those issues um, at a much higher level where we've been trying to for a long, long time and definitely hoping to see some, some more permanent solutions arise um, from here. I think the other, when we're talking about connectivity, isn't also just the actual um, connectivity in terms of internet, but also in terms of devices um, and the access to those, which again, is not just a, a rural and remote issue, but there were certainly a lot of, um, I guess, families who were able to race straight out, straight out and and get devices and access to devices that, that we don't actually have that access um, out in rural and remote areas. So um, it's also highlighted those sort of inequities um, going forward as well. So um, they, would, they would be just a couple that, that we've sort of seen along the way. And um, we've seen schools do some amazing things to address those. We've seen them hand out USBs and hard drives sent home with their borders when they've been, been handed um, back to their families so that they've been able to access that education in another way, even without relying on connectivity. So um, there's, there's been a lot of things done to address it. And now I think going forward, the other inequity we're seeing is that um, obviously for Queensland, but also um, Alana can mention the other states, we've seen uh, where the inequity where everyone's returning to school. However, there are still quite a lot of borders who are unable to do so because of the health restrictions of the pandemic. So we're facing another inequity here where we, we, we need to get these kids back because our concern now is around mental health and that what we were talking about before, that sense of belonging um, has now gotten even harder with a, most of their classmates back to face-to-face -face learning. Um, their sense of belonging has now been, been eroded and starting to be back to that sort of uneven uh, playing field again. So just another inequity going forward that we are all ICPA across all of our states and territories are addressing at the moment. Certainly uh, seeing that quite a lot around around where I am too. Um, Alana, from a, a, the federal president perspective, I'm sure there's uh, some some great uh, bits here bit we can we can use in our in our future work. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, not to make light of the situation that we've had, you know, um, it's been difficult. It's been challenging for everybody, and and you know, certainly don't want to make light of of the fact that that people have faced some really challenging circumstances and, and are still facing those. But um, certainly in the long run, I, it, it's given a, a um, highlight. Um, Tammy said what, what we've been doing forever, you know, for what feels like forever, um, you know, in that our families have to deal with these issues all the time. And um, certainly communications um, and, and the improvements there have, have been phenomenal. Um, over the last couple of years, but just in you know with COVID, that's you know what's come about with that, and and you know that who knows where that may to as well. Um, the other thing I think uh, is we which we um, has been highlighted is that situation where people are trying to work from them and trying to teach their kids, and the, and how that's a challenge. And when you're trying to manage your business, we do that all the time, you know. And same thing, 
my we, we as I said, we run a property, and our families, our rural and remote families, they run businesses, they run cattle stations, sheep stations, their farmers run businesses, and they have to have their children at home to teach them all the time, and and have somebody in the schoolroom with their schoolwork all the time as well. So, so um, I, I think it's really highlighted that issue, and I, I, you know, I would hope that it's highlighted that that issue that we have to. Um, provide those resources for our kids all the time that um, for anyone else who, who sends children to a, a mainstream school, regular school, their teacher has, you know, a certain amount of time of the day, even when particularly little children, but but you've still got to supervise older children even when they're on online lessons. You still have to have somebody supporting them and motivating them and keeping them connected. Um, the other thing more with the boarding schools too, and, and you know, Tammy touched on there, is there any... And it's, um, we're dealing with across the whole of Australia right now with, with boarders who still can't go into their boarding school. So they're having to stay home and, and keep uh, doing learning. But in a lot of the cases, online learning isn't available anymore because as I absolutely appreciate, the teachers can't do both. Um, so, you know, they're in a situation where they've, they've got to do their work themselves. And that also comes, that, that leads on to the next issue of why do we send our kids to boarding school? You know, there's been a, this school of thought, I think, a, a little bit elitist and, and we send them to boarding school because you know we don't like the local school but when you haven't got a local school you have to go to boarding school one get a satisfactory education and two get all those other things that are involved in education and you know we're talking about mental health issues we're talking about connection and when you're a teen if you're at home having to do to school with your family and and an hour and a half from your nearest town and, and half an hour from your nearest neighbour and you can't have any of those those physical connections that are so important within um, your development and, and to help motivate you with your education. If you ask the question in a, in a classroom or in a mainstream class, you ask the question, you know, what, for example, what... Uh, do living things need? You don't expect one child to answer everything. You get everybody to, to come in with those answers and, and that's to be able to, to learn. They need that interaction with other people. So um, I think in, it, it highlights the fact that for those kids that are sent away for boarding school, it's because they need more than what can be offered to them by just a distance education um, situation in an isolated area. And indeed, that, that distance and access is a massive, yeah, that, that massive access. access. So, um, yeah. Michael, internationally, this has been Michael, a, big, a, a big issue in terms of equity as well. So, the floor is yours. <laughs> yes, it's, um, it, it's been interesting because I, I think what you've heard with with what my colleagues have said so far, really equity from sort of three lenses. You know, there's the the the, the device and the connectivity as one. So essentially, you know, the, the bandwidth or the internet that's coming into the you know the homes and, and the number of laptops, iPads, Chromebooks, whatever you're using, you know, is is one of those issues. The the, the second one I think you've heard my colleagues talk about is the um, the equity of let's call it learning environment or learning support. You know, one of the things that we talked about, and I think all of us touched on it when you asked about, you know, what advice, you know, do we, the tips for parents was, you know, having a space for the, you know, the, the student to learn and ideally something that was a devoted space and you know and, and most of us talked about you know the, the engagement of the human resources that the the folks have in the home and there's a real disparity between you know those types of you know whether or not a, a parent can actively supervise and actively engage with a, a students while they're learning remotely or learning at a distance um, depending upon the context. And, and then the third one is, is the, the learner preparation or the learner readiness. Um, you know, there's a, a great despair, you know, our students that tend to be the higher performing students, you know, let's face it, during the last two months, we probably could have given them five textbooks and said, okay, you're going to be tested on this when you come back, whenever that happens to be, so be ready. And they would have been fine. 
um, you know, they are the ones that, assuming the other two aspects, or at least the, the first inequity issue, you know, the tools and the bandwidth has been available, they've been able to make this work. You know, we've got a lot of students that just don't have those, you know, self-motivation, self-regulation, self-directedness aspects. So there's a, a real inequity in the learner's ability to even engage in this kind of environment. Um, you know, and unfortunately, as teachers, that, in all honesty, I think is the one that we have the least control over. Um, you know, the, the, the school and, and the schooling authority has some ability to work with their partners to, to get internet to folks or to find ways of getting the content to students, finding ways to get devices to them even working with parents to find good models on how they can you know help support their child's education in the home um, the one thing that that schools school authorities and even individual teachers have little control over is how do we make it more equitable so that everyone has the opportunity to have success in this remote environment and, and that's the one that in all honesty regardless of context um, international, Australian, North American, what have you. I haven't seen good answers for it yet. Um, the other ones, I mean, I've seen some incredible things, you know, just south of me here. Um, the Fresno Unified School District was uh, actually their representative was one of the folks that talked to me in that five minute series. They re-imaged something like 10,000 devices in the span of less than a work week so that they would be able to then distribute those devices to students throughout their system and actually was a, were able to, while the uh, d uh, devices were being re-imaged, figure out who needed them and how many devices that were needed in, in each of the households. So we've seen some you know, exceptional examples of those kinds of things happening. Uh, it's on that third equity uh, issue that that we really haven't figured it out yet. I think that gives us a real focus as to where we can look moving <coughs> forward, both in terms of the lessons and where to go with with, with the work, Michael. So that's that's fantastic. Um, last word to Natalie before we um, look to wrap it up. Um, I actually want to end on a positive equity issue, noting that um, the distance education schools have actually been doing wonderful things for many years, and it's important to acknowledge that. And hopefully, this will show that. There, are, there is innovative things happening and we can get more support for the parents and teachers involved. Um, because these schools actually cater for students who can't attend their face to, a face-to-face -face school, whether that's geographically isolated for medical reasons um, or traveling, all sorts of reasons. So they cater for a very diverse range of students that wouldn't otherwise be able to access education. And the teachers and the parents involved do wonderful things to make sure that these students are educated and that should be acknowledged and we can all learn from that, even in face-to-face -face schools at the moment. Thanks, Emily. Look, I think uh, we've got wrapped up in the conversation that we're getting close to our, our, our hour time. We might be able to go over a little bit to this, if there's any questions. But um, before we do that, I, I want to thank, thank everyone. I want to thank you for coming up from the coast to be here uh, next to me, Natalie. Um, Tammy um, and Alana, being away from your families for this hour to, um, to spend some time with us and sharing your insights. Uh, Michael, 3 a.m. Man, um, big, big, big IOU in that one, mate. So thank you so much. Um, any any questions from uh, anyone who's who's listening there? I think we've got just got a couple of comments that people have found that useful. So we'll um, give it a moment. Otherwise, um, I'll. Um, See if anything comes through on our uh, AXA link. All right, so nothing's nothing's jumping up there at the moment. So maybe we're um, we're all we're all good. Um, please feel free, people who are there and people who subsequently um, come in and, and listen to the recording of this session. You know, you you can you can access us and we can see what we can uh, we can do. Um, but I think you've got five people here in the panel who have spent their a lot of their time and effort over the last while advocating for many years on behalf of the, the kids in rural Australia, regional areas internationally, um, and in, in America. 
So I really appreciate everyone's work and the insights. And I really hope that what we've experienced the last little while can um, put that work in the position where it needs to be and try to make some real difference even more so for the kids that we, we work with. So thank you everyone so very much for your time this evening. Thank you, Phil. Um, Ruth, you will help me when that has stopped recording or going live. <laughs>